Something that's interesting to me is that um, within feminist art and nascent feminist discourse, there was such a premium that was placed on women's expression and bringing a, a feminist iconography into the into the work of, of painting. And when you changed your intention to try to address um, Native American experience or history with the Chief Joseph series, which is not only your personal history, but, but larger as a as a culture, as a as a yeah. location on this earth. What was it that you found that this language of, of almost austere abstraction provided or enabled you to communicate that you felt like you couldn't with representational images? Well, a lot of what went on. Um, for one thing, the, the first paintings I did when I went to Pratt were about my work aprons. And um, they're, they're just paintings of aprons. Um, and using different methods, I was, I was dripping and, and uh, painting with my hands and uh, pouring paint and do, doing all sorts of things. As, and so they were used as experiments in ways of, of painting, putting paint on a canvas. Um, but they also were using this draped fabric shape because an apron tied up on the wall is a drape. So I think that that led me to being involved and interested in the, the shapes that I saw on the, on the, uh, the bridges. I was... Uh, driving to Pratt from Englewood, New Jersey, and uh, looking at the, the bridges that were being painted, and they all had huge draped fabrics on them. And I had just done a, a series of paintings about my work aprons, and I saw these draped, huge, huge draped fabrics, and obviously they were to catch people if they fell. I mean, there was a reason for these drapes, right? And uh, I was very taken with the shapes. So I started making paintings based on those shapes. So that there was this sort of gradual movement from realism or kind of realism, these, these uh, aprons, to abstraction. And in a way, the draped shapes, which seem very abstract now, are actually uh, uh, an assignable, shape this is a thing mm -hmm. so my movement into abstraction was was not uh fast and at the same time i was looking at a lot of very reductive abstraction in new york and found it um well interesting and exciting um but also limited in that uh, it was emotionless, much of it. I was trying to integrate all these ideas of the New York art world and somehow find a way for me to utilize those uh, very attractive ideas to me. I like the notion of reduction, of reducing things to their absolute minimum and still have meaning. Uh, so I was playing with a lot of ideas all at the same time. And, but I came to abstraction slowly. It wasn't that I woke up one morning and said, oh, well, I'm going to be an abstract artist now. To your point, going back to graduate school at the age of 38, you're a grown-up 
you know, you've had an entire life and you have probably very clear sense of what it was that art was for you and where you wanted it to go or what you aspired to. I'm not sure I knew, but I knew I could find, I would, I knew I could find it. I -hmm. perhaps wasn't sure in my mind what it is I was looking for, but I also know that you can find things through the act of painting, which Mm -hmm. is what I was depending upon. Mm-hmm. Which is what's wonderful about painting is you can discover things through it. Mm-hmm. Um, what I what I um, imagine also is that at that age, you're making this big decision in your life. You know, you you have a whole life, and you're like, I want something different in a specific way in terms of what I'm doing with my painting. And I don't think that anyone who makes that decision thinks, well, I'd like to modulate uh, shapes on a canvas in slightly different ways. You know, I feel like there is a deeper meaning there already in terms of a belief in what art is or can be. So at that moment, how would you have characterized that desire that led you back to studying uh, painting in New York? Oh, I, I think that the idea was there from the moment I graduated from college. It was just that it, uh, there were other things to do that, mm-hmm. that it was important to do at that time. I didn't want to mm-hmm. put off having children, for instance. A lot of women did. I just didn't think that was a good idea. Um, and I wanted, but I wanted to go to graduate school uh, because I felt it was needed. I felt that I, I needed that. I needed that. <clears throat> perhaps entree to the New York art world, uh, intellectual entree, that is. Um, I wanted to be the best damn painter I could. And I knew that I had to know more. I had to experience more to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I was wondering if there are actually different modes. And one, which I would think of abstract, and then the other, which would be non-representational. Whereas the, ab- <laughs> <laughs> whereas the things that people call quote unquote landscapes are actually abstract. They're literally Absolutely. abstracted from the world. All painting is abstract. Yes, but, but the, other, um, the other panels that engage in geometric forms, those feel to me like they're not abstracting from the world in the same in the same sense but that they might actually um depict the world in a in a different language and i wonder how you regard those t- those sides of the panels well in it, it often depends on the painting itself okay. but in general one is um like a snapshot it is a a fast, momentary view of a place, not really in high realism at all. Um, As you said, it's a very abstract view of a place. And the other is a more interior or a more long-term expression. Sometimes they refer to the cosmos Mm -hmm. um, in a very general way. Um, Sometimes they are simply about, um, what was it, as somebody called it, a hypnagogic uh, imagery, that which Mm -hmm. you see right before you go to sleep, you know, this momentary... um, shape so they do have they take on different meanings to me um depending on the paintings themselves um i think the later ones um the ones that have a lot of gold in them um very often refer to the uh that which is beyond uh, beyond our immediate senses, whether it's uh, you, you read that as, as heaven or you read it as 
uh, the cosmos, or you read it as in some other way. It is that which we do not see, but very often uh, sense. Well, you know, when you were speaking, it occurred to me that the distinctions of time or duration as they function in the painting are very interesting. Because if you talk about something like a landscape, oh, it's a landscape. Well, a landscape is a very complicated thing when you start thinking about frameworks of time because you have geologic time. You have the fleeting moment of the, the, the sun coming through a cloud on a particular moment in which the painting is made. So even within that subject matter, in a way you're negotiating these overlaid frameworks of temporality um, in, in the space of the painting. It's almost like that's what the painting's um, mission is, or it's like it's, 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 its goal is to kind of somehow reconcile these question of time in relationship to the land. And um, how do you think of that? Because on the one hand, abs geometric abstraction engages with a different sense of time yes. than the other representations of land. Well, I'm working on a painting right now that's um, about the Grand Canyon. And the uh, in the foreground, there will be a um, pattern of, of, of the Havasupai people who, who live in the canyon. Uh, uh, there's a long a political, complex political history about that, which I won't go into, but the point of it is that the Havasupai have been there forever. And uh, this, this canyon uh, is part of our American uh, imagery. Uh, it is so much of America. Uh, it is something that's been there for eons, uh, slowly deepening. Um, you can actually see the river in this painting. Um, so that I'm dealing with something that is um, not timeless, but very old and has been through a lot of changes and uh, the people are included in it who have also been there for eons. Uh, although there's not, they are not pictured they are referred to through the pattern. Mm -hmm. So it is in a sense about time, but also it happens to be morning. So it's a, it also shows a kind of time of day. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that they, I think it's a, an interesting observation you've made about the idea of time in the paintings because it is, there is a strong sense of time. Well, also in the motif of the cross in some of those paintings, it, that to me also speaks about time and location in very almost like deep structural ways. And um, I don't know how you <laughs> how you might relate to that, but I put it in because it's a it's a symbol that many. Native people across the continent uh, honor. Um, we pray to the four directions. So it's a, it's a common uh, Native symbol. Now, as you know, there are many, many different cultures in, the, in this continent. Uh, language, for instance, great deals, great differences in language among the uh, Native peoples. Uh, the differences are, are extreme, as, as extreme as, say, Chinese is to English. So it isn't that we're all the same, but there are a few symbols that have meaning, generally have meaning, and one of them is a four directions symbol. It is also a Christian cross. I was raised as a Christian. So that this meaning, it has meaning for me <clears throat> in a a very uh, dual way in that it's a four directions cross, but it's also a Christian cross. I think that it's a symbol that is, is used in many, many other cultures worldwide. 
I mean, it's such a simple, it's a plus sign after all, there's more there. Uh, <clears throat> so it was, it's kind of a natural thing to use. The paintings where you, which I think are probably what's among the most recognized of your work, where you have an abstract, though legible uh, landscape painting that has within it an overlaid pattern, Native American pattern into the landscape, not necessarily integrated in pictorial space, but um, not, rep not integrated in representational space, but in, in pictorial space as a two-dimensional surface. And, and when did you first hit on that as a mode for a painting as opposed to the two distinct halves of the painting? Um, that too took a while, it, it grew, but I was, um, I went out to Montana to, um, to follow the trail, the Chief Joseph Trail through the, um, uh, through the mountains in Montana up to uh, the last battlefield, which was a bear paw, I believe it was called. And um, I got involved in um, the par flesh bags of the uh, uh, Northern Siouan tribes. Um, they're commonly made by the people who, uh, of, that, of that era, of that area rather. And uh, it's all, they're all made by women. It's a, it's a woman's craft, a woman's art. And they are very, very beautiful. They're striking. And it's American modernism, actually. It's the first American modernism. I started using the par flesh bags with the, the paintings and drawings. And then I thought, well, gee, I can use other patterns from other uh, forms that, that people made and have gone from there. I'm still curious into how, at what moment or how did you feel empowered or confident enough as an artist to claim this wide stretch of of history and and say you know I have the right to this and this is this is not? what you as an artist hmm? why not why not why not take it I was old enough to see that there was no reason to stop I wasn't an eighteen year old you know I was a middle aged lady who uh, still wanted to be the best possible painter that I could and. I wanted those paintings to have um, a truth, a deep truth. Well, in that regard, one of the things that I, um, in the symposium that was organized around your Smithsonian show, I love Paul Chat Smith. Wasn't and I think, <laughs> first of all, yeah. where's his um, MacArthur? Because he deserves he one. He's just brilliant, but brilliant man. One of the one of the things I loved about what he said was that what's shocking is not that um, you're a committed Christian, but that you are a Catholic. Uh, because, <laughs> 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 and um, so in that sense, I want to talk about Rome and about that particular history of Christian painting, because it seems to me that a distinction between being um, a a Protestant and a Catholic, there are the theological differences, but it, those theological differences seem to me to have like enormous aesthetic implications. And um, so could you talk about your, as an artist and as a human being, the impact of Rome and that particular art history on you? There's so much to say, I don't know where to start. Um, I'll start with Catholicism because there is, it is a humorous notion in a way. But the reason for becoming a Catholic for me was that um, in a sense, it is more broad and more accepting than, uh, now there's different areas of, you know, of viewpoints about the, um, how broad the Catholic Church is. 
So that th there was a is a broader sense uh, in the Catholic Church uh, that I found. Um, it also has this great history of um, going back to um, the classical Rome. Uh, when you think of someplace like Ravenna, which is absolutely divine, and it is, uh, those mosaics date from something like 325. They're very, very early ones. Uh, they date back to the, the Council of Nicaea. It's, it's, um, so it has this great history and also swell art. I mean, just terrific art. And it, it also seems to me that most of the great art of the world has a, well, I shouldn't say most, but much of the great art of the world has a religious implication, whether it's Eastern all the time. or Western or Native or whatever. It has this sense that uh, God is with us. Well, I mean, I myself found, um, like I was ex raised extremely religiously in the South. And like in normal teenage way, I was like, I'm an atheist, I reject all of this. And then I sort of took art as the, the alternate religion. And then there was a moment where I was in graduate school teaching an art history class and I realized I'm gonna be talking about Jesus the rest of my life. You know, yeah. the rest of the time I'm doing this. <laughs> and- <laughs> That was horrifying at that moment. And then the deeper that I found my relationship to art history got to not even to art history, to art, to really looking at those paintings, you know, really looking at a Caravaggio, the, the more the, the structure of belief that is, that is the chassis of those paintings became real to me. And it, it really, I, I feel like in a way, like, attending to those paintings in their own terms brings you into a kind of spiritual communion, which is of course part of their intention in addition to being propaganda for the church, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to know more about your experience with that because I also think that your contact with Rome was later, I mean, you were already a very um, established artist by the I time you had that encounter. Artist, yeah. <clears throat> I, I fell in love with Rome, boy, oh boy. And I fell in love with the language. I fell in love with the uh, art. It was just a, a wonderful experience. I had been to Rome before and seen it as a tourist, but going there to live for months at a time is a very different kind of experience. Uh, going to these various places um, of interest architecturally as well as um, the other arts, um, painting, of course, especially, and sculpture. Um, it was just a very full experience for me, very uh, open so much. It was there that I started to use brushes again. I've been painting with my hands for years. Um, I started to use gold leaf there because there's all that gold in the churches. And in spite of the fact that I know that that gold was stolen from the Americas and they had probably slave Indian laborers uh, mining for that gold. It's Peruvian, much of it. So <clears throat> in spite of all that, I found the gold very moving and very uh, a beautiful um, physical presence. It's very physical the gold. And I finally saw all those Caravaggios. Rome is just loaded with Caravaggios. And the, the drama. Uh, and when I was in, in school um, as a kid, the Caravaggios were kind of laughed at as, you know, um, too dramatic, etc. And uh, I just fell in love with them all. 
And I knew they were wrong when they, I heard it for the first place. I knew that there, there was a, these were great paintings. Um, but it is amazing to think that, that Caravaggio was actually uh, put down for a lot of years. Can't imagine. Well, well, for most of art history, actually. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't reemerge as a major painter until basically the 20th century. Right, right. So it's just amazing. Anyway, I saw all those. And, you know, they, they were, um, the drama of them, I, I think, is uh, very moving. And the, the fact that uh, they are so moving indicates to me, as, as you said, that there is, there was a, um, a strong spiritual component to this, to uh, Caravaggio's makeup. In spite of all the stories about him, uh, which are, are wonderful and colorful and interesting and all that, he was a deeply spiritual man or he could not have done those paintings. One thing that strikes me in, in your explanation or the story you were just telling is the contradictory things that you say, like in spite of my knowledge of the Peruvian gold and its horrors on the new world, and in spite of the fact that we know that Caravaggio is literally a murderer. <laughs> um, and it feels to me like one of the capacities for art is to allow that kind of extremely deep knowledge of things that may seemingly contradict itself to coexist. And you experience that kind of, of, of layered, you know, layered reality that doesn't have to be coherent in a particular way. And um, I don't know, how do you, how does that strike you? Well, I, I, we're humans on the planet. Uh, we um, have no place else to go. This is our home, Earth is our home. And we have to deal with it. We have to make it as, if we can, we have to make it a better place if we possibly can. But the truth is that we have to live in it as it is, unless we're an absolute ascetic and uh, go off into the woods. Uh, we have to live with it as it is and make it better when we can, but, understand that we are humans and humans are fallible. One thing that has always been very interesting to me is um, th the fact that Black Elk was also like essentially a lay Catholic priest and did a lot of, of creative religious thinking about the relationship between what we would think of as a, as a traditional native religion and um, Catholic belief or, or, or Christian belief. And in that sense, it seems like there is this enormous tradition and capacity for that kind of broad syncretist thought. For various reasons, because of the American Indian movement, there was a huge emphasis that was played up on the, the return to a certain kind of in, traditional uh, religion and belief structure. And I'm wondering how that has caused you um, to navigate discussing your own religious belief in your work vis-a-vis -vis your the part of your heritage, which is Native American, um, with the part of it that isn't, which, which really is Scotch-Irish Christian mm -hmm. ancestry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've never had a problem with it. Um, I think that um, some of the most spiritual people I've ever known um, were Hopis. And they, they have a very, um, uh, perhaps strict is the wrong word, but they have very strong ideas about behavior and um, uh, how one relates to another. And for me, um, we are all uh, related. We're all close. We are all one 
humankind. And uh, we may have different paths to God, but that doesn't, that, there's no reason that that should separate us in any way. Um, I'm sure that that's seen as sort of naive when you think of the, the wars that have been perpetrated to, because of religion. Um, but nevertheless, I believe that we are one. In those terms, after having lived your life, I mean, I, I truly believe that you have to, oh, excuse me, that you have to live your life in a particular way in order to make a certain kind of art. And uh, I'm, I'm wondering at this point, after having devoted yourself to making and thinking art for your entire life, how do you understand what it means to be an artist or what that, what that role is? I think it comes back for me to the idea that, that uh, art is a language and it's a language that uh, can tell people about all sorts of things. But in my case, I think I'm telling them about uh, the earth and its grandeur and uh, our place on it, uh, natives as well as non-natives. Um, that we have to somehow save this place, this planet, which is the only place we have. Um, it's very straightforward messages I have, nothing esoteric. Mm -hmm. One of the paintings, one of your paintings that is almost an outlier, but is reproduced in, in one of your monographs that I found enormously just almost unbearably beautiful is the little icon that you made of the Cherokee Jesus. Oh and yeah. I just wanted to to talk with you more about that and and where that painting resides. Like, why did you make it and where does it reside for you? Do you know the artist um, Dirk Boots or Bouts? Maybe it's pronounced. I always pronounce it wrong. I think it's 15th century, but I'm not sure. At any rate, I saw a painting of his, of, of Jesus with a golden background, not done like mine, it was the opposite. The cross was golden and the background was red. Anyway, similar. And this Jesus was obviously a German. I mean, you couldn't look more German, you know? <laughs> and, I mean, it was just like, Okay, it is a German Jesus, that's okay. But I thought, well, if Dirk Boats can do a German Jesus, I can do an Indian Jesus. And so I, I painted this Indian Jesus and I was uh, recovering from cancer at the time. <clears throat> so I would, uh, so I couldn't go into my studio very often because I was in um, chemo. And so when I would go in, I would work on my uh, Indian Jesus. And I would talk to him, um, you know, you've got to help me with this. You've got to help me. Um, because I was making him up. I didn't have a model. I just made him up. So he's, he's very young. He's just a boy. You know, he looks to be like maybe 20. And uh, no beard, of course. Uh, because um, Indians don't have beards. There's a category of, of a Renaissance painting, which is like devotional, right? And yeah. I, what I love about that is that it's like a tool for praying or for meditating. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's so interesting to realize that that was, you basically made yourself a little devotional painting. I did. I did that. And mm -hmm. as I said, it, it helped me get through a difficult time because mm -hmm. I had something that was uh, I had to focus on, and um, I have a, it's in a, a Florentine style frame, and I scratched into the, the paint on the frame, the name Jesus Christ in uh, Cherokee. So it has Cherokee at the top of it, with a dove. <clears throat> so beautiful. 
I would love to hear more about your thoughts on the Manet painting of the dead Christ. Would you tell me why that painting means so much to you and how does it mean? When I first, uh, it's not when I first saw it because it's been in the Met for as long as I can remember, but, <clears throat> and they've moved it, which confuses me, but um, I went, I was having trouble with the notion of, of, of painting the, um, the corporeal and the incorporeal. Mm -hmm. I was raised uh, with these words. As a kid, I had no idea what they meant. Um, but this notion of the incorporeal. And <clears throat> so I, I felt that that's in a way what I was doing with those paintings that I made around the time of my first husband's passing. And they were, it was about the corporeal in the, the it was a landscape and the incorporeal, which was that space beyond our space. Um, I, I saw that painting of um, the dead Christ and it's very beautiful in color and, it has. It does also has that static quality of this triangular composition, you know. And um, if you look at his legs, uh, one of the, and the one near the snake. There's a snake at, at the um, in the lower. Um, it would have to be the, the lower right quadrant. There's a snake, and uh, of course, it's the devil. And this foot that's that's near that seems to be rising. It mm. isn't actually solidly painted sitting on the earth. And there's also a hand that seems to be slightly rising. It is mm. not, I mean, he can paint solid flesh like crazy. There's no reason why he would not make this a solid hand sitting on whatever it's sitting on. Um, so it seemed to me that Manet was addressing this notion of the incorporeality as well as the corporeality of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, it's possible to do it. He's done it. To listen to you describe it, isn't it, in, in, especially in Manet's case, wouldn't this problem of the compor corporeal and incorporeal be the problem of painting itself? <laughs> when, when you talk about making an image of a thing that has its own kind of presence or, or, or vi viability as an as an image in the world, but that also is just a surface. It's just stuff on a surface. Just stuff on a surface. I want to thank you for, for that because I, um, that's a painting that I have never had an intuitive understanding of. I've always found it very confusing, but I, I think that what you're, you're narrating your own experience of it or understanding of it, I think made the things that are confusing about it technically um, open up as, as actually like the bearers of meaning, which makes sense. But well, he may not have he may not have intended it that I, I I have no way of knowing after all. Um, but it it has a great deal of meaning to, had a great deal of meaning to me when I first saw it, and it's uh, the weeping angels I've always found very moving as well. Mm -hmm. with their blue wings why not blue that's the sacred color right well it's mary's sacred color sure mm -hmm. yeah we've talked about so so many wonderful things i'm really appreciative for your time my pleasure my pleasure and um well it's been fascinating to hear your take on various things. <laughs>